Hello everyone and welcome to the San Jose State University School of Library and Information Science Career Colloquia Series. We're thrilled to see so many people online with us tonight. This is Jill Cleese. I'm the career consultant for our SLIS students and alumni. I'd like to thank each of you for joining us tonight in our discussion on new career pathways for information professionals. We are very fortunate to have our very own Dr. Sandra Hirsch, Professor and Director of SJSU SLIS, share with us her great insight into thinking broadly about how to use your MLIS skill set. Our session will last one hour. I ask that you hold all questions until the end where we will have time for a Q&A. Also, please do keep the dialogue in the chat box to a minimum. And this session is being recorded and will be made available on the SLIS Colloquia page. So let's get started. Take it away, Dr. Hirsch. Thank you very much, Jill. So uh, I am very pleased to be talking with you today about the opportunities that I see for new information professionals entering the field. I believe that there are continually new and evolving job opportunities which either require an MLIS or which you can make the case for that the um, MLIS degree has prepared you with the relevant skill sets. My goal for this presentation today is to stimulate you to think more broadly about our profession and also the varied opportunities that people with library and information science skill sets can pursue. Prior to becoming the director of the School of Library and Information Science here at San Jose State University just 18 months ago, I had spent the previous 12 years using my library and information science skill sets in non-library environments as a researcher and program director in a research and development setting at HP Labs and also as a user experience researcher and manager of a global user experience team in product development settings at Microsoft and LinkedIn. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that background in a little bit, um, but just as background, I just share that um, initially. I have personally found that our library and information science training provides us with a user-centered perspective that adds value in numerous work environments, and also that our understanding of how to best organize and make information accessible to um, user needs is unparalleled. In this presentation, I will discuss the types of library and information science skills and expertise that are in demand today, as well as the new career pathways that people with library and information science training and experience can pursue. I will also discuss some of the strategies that I, I, that I see effective for how to succeed in these new career environments, and then I'm going to wrap up with some final thoughts. And I'm looking forward to your questions at the end, too, so save them up. In a book that was published last year about what it means to be an information professional today, Lawson and others discuss how the field of library and information science uniquely brings together a range of disciplines, experiences, and knowledge that is increasingly opening up new career pathways for people. I think that this quote, that I use this quote at the beginning because I think it sets a good context for the rest of what I'll be talking about today. So to start off with, I want to talk about uh, a few of the key characteristics that I think are required as information professionals and job seekers today. In order to be responsive to, the con to constant change, it's essential that, um, that uh, job seekers and professionals be adaptable and be continually uh, learning uh, throughout their career. So a few months ago, I attended uh, the Internet Librarian Conference, and in a very interesting opening keynote talk by John Seeley Brown, who was formerly the chief scientist at Xerox Park and is now at University of Southern California, he talked about the need to become an entrepreneurial learner, especially given how quickly the digital infrastructure is changing. And he talked about the half-life of a given skill has shrunk to five years. I think that's fascinating for us to be thinking about as, um, as people who are, are attending this talk are either uh, current students or people who have uh, received their uh, master's degree in library and information science. So what this means is that we need to be continually learning new skills in new ways. And we also need to be continually refreshing our skill sets and learning new ones and also be thinking about how to apply these skills not only in new ways but also in new environments. I 
I think we also need to be getting used to that constant change. Uh, we can't expect that things are going to remain the same. This rapid change in technology spurs the rapid change in types of jobs that are available and the growth of also of new opportunities. I think it's important to stay attuned to the types of skills that are desirable and the types of jobs that call for these new skills. Like when I think back at my own experience and I think back to my time in library school about 20 years ago, there is no way that I could have predicted the birth of the Internet, the ubiquity of mobile devices, or the intensity with which we would all be connected, or that there would be new types of jobs out there that were completely unimaginable at the time I was in school, such as creating web experiences and products to meet people's needs, that we would be providing so many information services virtually, and that so much of the work that we would be doing would be distributed in nature, including our online program. The lesson of all of this is that it is critical to maintain a certain amount of flexibility in your career. That's important both when you're looking for a new career opportunities and also when you're staying in the same position. Um, I think flexibility helps to make sure that you don't get stalled out in your career. And over time, um, some of these uh, types of positions may disappear while others may not have yet even been created. So it's critical to maintain an openness in job seeking, both in terms of looking in library settings and also looking in non-library settings. So there are, um, there can be many factors that influence why it can be hard to find a job and we hear a lot about this in the literature and, and, and a lot of concern about this. But here I decided I would highlight a couple of the common reasons why um, people find it difficult to find, um, find work. Um, one of the most common uh, reasons is geography. Um, the reality is, is that people are often tied to a specific city or region and don't have that flexibility to move for a job and this obviously can limit your options and opportunities. Another reason is that the economy has affected different job sectors um, and, and environments differently and libraries have been hit hard, harder hit, especially in state and local governments. Additionally, some, sometimes when you're looking for job opportunities, you'll find that the job postings seem to require experience or skill levels that you don't have to, um, that you don't happen to have at that particular time. And this is why it's so important to be flexible wherever you can be flexible, such as being flexible about the job environment, regardless of well, whether the opportunities are in libraries or outside of libraries, and being open to exploring different types of job titles and roles that, um, since since there may be these other constraints. You might be open, you might need to be more flexible in other areas. The good news is that there are increasingly opportunities for people with library and information science skill sets in a growing range of contexts. So looking in different job environments can open doors to new opportunities. According to the 2011 Annual Library Journal Placements and Salary Survey, there are increasing job opportunities for people with masters in library and information science degrees beyond the traditional library and job environment, especially in the private sector. Similarly, um, in the most recent U.S. Department of Labor Bureau of Labor Statistics Occupational Outlook Handbook, um, the handbook identified a similar trend. Note that this is from 2010 to 2011. That is the most current data to date. They said that the next edition is not available until March. Um, the handbook talked about the range of job opportunities which are increasingly available for people with degrees in library and information science that are available outside of the library. And these ranged from technical areas such as internet coordination and um, database development to leveraging our content ex expertise in roles such as web content management and publishing to our strong analytic and instructional skills that we possess in roles such as marketing and training. So what are, are some of the most desirable knowledge and experience, experiences that a degree in library and information science prepares you for? One of the things that our school does is it annually reviews over 500 job listings appearing, appearing in library-centric job listing sites like ALA, SLA, and 
other, and, and other library-centric job posting sites, and also in more general job posting sites like monster.com, indeed.com, et cetera. We then categorize the job listings as either traditional or um, as traditional or emerging job titles, and with the emerging job titles, those that have started appearing within the last few years. We also compile the most cited skills and responsibilities for these job categories. The results from August 2011 suggest that our knowledge of metadata, instruction, and technology, especially in the area of integrated library systems and Web 2.0 applications, are the most highly sought after skills. Additionally, our experience in reference continues to be important. And to this, I would add that our user-centered focus and knowledge about information organization are also very desirable skills. In this job postings analysis, we also look at job, emerging job titles. I've divided these up into two categories. This particular slide shows the emerging job titles for positions within library settings. So even, with, even within library settings, the types of roles that people with library and information science degrees are being called to play are evolving, and what the work is being called is shifting. And as you can see, the focus is increasingly around positions um, dealing with metadata, emerging technologies, virtual or e-learning services, and digital collections and initiatives. Recent graduates of library and information information science programs are increasingly being called on to leverage their expertise that they're getting in programs like ours, where they have the expertise with latest technologies, and being asked to help integrate those technologies into library settings. IMLS recently funded a planning grant for our school to explore the development of a residency model that would help facilitate that process of matching up recent graduates who have possessed those emerging technology skills and helping to integrate those technologies in emerging in um, public and academic libraries. And this is a project that actually I'm a PI on, and we, we're calling that project the Catalyst Project. So if you want more information, I'd be happy to provide that. Um, there may be other opportunities similar to this as well that may emerge, so it's good to watch for whether, um, keep your eye on other possibilities in that area. So what I'd like to do now is to share a case study with you, uh, kind of demonstrating some of the new opportunities that people with a degree in library and information science can get in library settings. In this particular case, this student, who is a graduate of our program, um, developed a new role for himself, which involved developing best practices for acquiring, capturing, processing, and describing born digital materials. What is especially interesting in, in this particular case study is that he started in a part-time role that involved making backup copies of a collection that had some born digital files in a personal computer. But what he was able to do was he was successful in lobbying to expand the scope of his responsibilities into the university's first digital archivist position, and in that role, working to create best practices for born digital materials. I think this is a really good example of new roles within library settings that are being developed, and I think it was going to be really interesting to see what additional new roles will be needed to meet the continually changing user needs and technology developments that we're seeing in libraries. So drawing again on that job postings analysis that our school performed, this time we're, look, we're looking at the emerging job titles that we're seeing that call for skills for people with our kind of background, library and information science degrees, but are not in library settings. These titles, as you notice, um, don't use the word librarian in them, but they do reference our core skill sets and the descriptions of what they're looking for in those positions. As you can see in this list, we leverage our deep understanding of user needs and technology to fill roles like social skills, media liaison, and usability analyst. We can also use our expert research skills and, and analysis skills to fill roles like business intelligent al uh, intelligence analyst and information specialist. We can use our expertise in how to organize information and user needs in roles like information architect, web content manager, um, and, uh, and media taxonomist. So what I want to do now is cover another case study of one of our graduates of our program. 
And in this case, the student was strategic in his approach to finding a job, and I think this is an interesting approach. By subscribing to different email lists in the field and by doing targeted searches of job lists by keyword, by, um, such as metadata, digital um, asset, and content. So they did this kind of keyword search on the um, different job lists, and that led him to job opportunities that he would not have otherwise thought of. So he focused on searching for skills that matched rather than by looking specifically at certain job titles. As a result, he landed this job very quickly, applying his library and information science skill sets to work on a content delivery team to support product management and marketing for a large software company, Adobe Systems. So I think this is also an interesting job strategy that people can um, pay attention to and learn from. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about my own career path because um, I had a particularly varied career path and I think there's some things that hopefully can be um, useful to you as you're thinking about your career and how you move it forward. So as you can see from this, I've worked in a variety of roles applying my library and information science skill sets, but in roles that were not labeled as librarian and in what were career roles that didn't even exist when I was in library school. So one of the things I did was to continually think about the skills I had learned and then figure out how to map them to the new job roles and job environments that were available. As you can see from my career path on this slide, you will notice that my career has involved time as a professor in academia, as a researcher in an R&D setting, um, in user experience working on consumer product development, and now I'm really pleased that I've come full circle by returning back to academia here at San Jose State University. I, if I, you had asked me when I was in library school, could I have imagined this particular career path? I, there would have been no way. I, um, I would have never imagined that my career could have taken so many interesting twists and turns. But I think it's important to um, continually grow and learn new skills and be open to new opportunities. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into a little more detail about a couple of these job transitions that I, um, in my own career, and highlight some of the strategies that I used to find these job opportunities. And perhaps some of the job seeking strategies will be useful to you when you start looking for your next job. And um, perhaps one of the things we can talk about at the end is and to hear a little bit about some of the job strategies that you found to be effective. Okay, so the first one is talking about moving into industry in an untraditional library position. So after I finished my PhD, I went into academia at first at the University of Arizona. However, after teaching for a few years, I actually needed to move to the Bay Area because my husband got a job here in the Silicon Valley. When I was looking at the options for myself and thinking about what I wanted to do, I realized that there were no academic positions for me in library and information science at that time in the Bay Area. And since I was living in Tucson, Arizona, I didn't have any contacts in the Silicon Valley. I thought, well, maybe I need to turn to my own professional network first. So I turned to my UCLA dissertation advisor and asked whether she had anybody she could recommend that I speak with in the Silicon Valley. And she gave me three names. Um, she gave me the, the names of three head librarians at three different companies um, who were at the time at Xerox Park, at Sun Microsystems, and HP Labs. And I called up, cold called each one of them in turn and I explained to them what I was looking for. I wanted some sort of a research position, perhaps an R&D or an industry. Um, neither of my conversations with the librarians at Xerox Park or Sun Microsystems led to anything. However, when I called the head librarian of the HP Labs Research Library, Eugenie Prime, and I asked her for names of other people I should talk to, she said, she told me instead that she had a dream of creating a new role and perhaps I might have the right background for this position that she wanted to create. So she asked me to send my resume to her and she said that she would like to talk more, but she never gave me any other names of people that I could contact. So I decided to create an opportunity 
to continue our conversation. So I called her up and I told her, um, hey, I'm going to be visiting the Bay Area and would you be interested in meeting with me? And she said, sure, she'd love to meet with me. So I actually didn't have a plan to be there, but I immediately booked an airplane ticket out to the Bay Area. And fortunately, my brother was living in the area, so I was able to stay with him. And so I decided to create the opportunity to have that conversation with her and to see where that might lead. So when I met with her, she described her dream of having the HP Labs Research Library not just provide um, service to the HP Labs scientists and engineers, but instead that the library would have a research arm that would focus on researching and improving the way that information was integrated and how it informed R&D with the ultimate aim of improving the quality and the throughput of R&D research and innovation. She actually asked me to draft a white paper defining this new role that she could then shop around internally within HP Labs to get the position created. So that's when I took a really big chance. I invested the time to write this white paper for a position that didn't even exist. It ended up being worth it because they created the position for me and I ended up being the director of this newly created information research program. And this turned out to be an amazing opportunity to do this kind of research affecting internal R&D researchers' productivity and success. So you see on the slide I identified some of the strategies I think you could take away from that um, experience in terms of how to leverage your network, creating opportunities for yourself and taking a chance. So I loved this position and I ended up staying there for five, six and a half years. However, after a while, uh, after a while, I started to want to have more direct impact on people's lives rather than just researching problems that focused internally within a company. Also, it was time to diversify as both my husband and I were working at HP at that time and HP was doing layoffs at least once a year. It was too stressful for us to both be there and so I thought it was time to make a move. So, but given the uniqueness of my role at HP Labs, I had to think very creatively about what my next job role was going to be. I didn't have that kind of cookie cutter experience that fit neatly into job postings that I was seeing. And I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do next. Did I want to be a consultant? Did I want to go back to working in libraries? Did I want to do, go into market research? What kind of role was I looking for? And what was the appropriate job title that would match my unique blend of experience, expertise, and interests? I, so what I, my approach was I reviewed different job postings and looked at the different required skills that they had and I thought about what might be the best fit for my interests. And I d ended up deciding that I wanted to find an opportunity to do user research on a user experience team. I thought this would be a good fit because I could apply my knowledge about the users and my passion for users really and my expertise in performing research to help improve product design. Even though I didn't come from what was traditionally the academic discipline that, um, you know, people went into from that background, usually people in user experience were coming from areas like um, with masters in human computer interaction or human factors. And even though I hadn't quite exactly done that exact work before, I knew in my heart that I had the right set of skills and that I had something extra that I could bring to it and that I brought a different perspective that could be valuable to an employer. So what I needed to find was a company and the opportunity that would recognize that and that wouldn't be closed-minded to my different background and my different kind of training that I brought to the table. So what my next step was, was to start attending local professional networking events where other people with, um, in the user experience space um, would be attending and other possible future employers might be attending. So one of the things I did is I found that um, there was an opportunity to attend a local Bay Chi event. A Bay Chi event is a local Bay Area computer inter human interaction event um, and it was being held in Berkeley that I drove out to one night. And one of, the, one of the things I forced myself to do was to make it worth my time that I went out all the way out to Berkeley to do this. I forced myself to introduce myself to the people who were at the meeting, who it turned out one of them was actually hiring. And I also went up and introduced myself to one of the speakers because she said she was hiring. At, 
this ended up being a very productive approach because I ended up getting two invitations to interview out of that one event, and one of those turned out to be turned into a job offer at Microsoft. So you can see the different job strategies I listed here on this slide in terms of identifying your transferable skills, exploring different types of job titles to figure out what kind of things might be the right match for your unique blend of experience, and then putting yourself out there and networking, attending events, um, and um, you know, making the effort to meet uh, uh, other people introducing yourself. So I ended up staying at Microsoft for five and a half years, working in all different areas of consumer product design for television, mobile, Hotmail, MSN, and many other products. It was a fast-paced environment that I loved, but there were frequent reorganizations, constantly changing management, and there were career advancement challenges that made me ready for a job change. I will only mention this last job transition briefly because it's probably not as relevant for you as um, this is about my eventual job transition back into academia, which turned into my current role as director of the school. However, I do want to mention that it can be useful to have a long-term career plan. For example, for me, I had really enjoyed being a professor when I was at the University of Arizona. And I would have been happy staying there, but needed to, to leave for family reasons. So as a result, I had it, always had it in my long-term career plans to return to academia at some point. Wasn't sure how or when or what the circumstances would be to lead me back to that. But I knew that if I did want to go back into academia, I would have to maintain my publishing record, maintain my professional connections to the field of library and information science, and build up my leadership roles. So even though Microsoft um, did not encourage or support my publication or engagement in professional associations, especially since I was working in product development as opposed to in R&D, I still worked above and beyond my demanding job to ensure that I was maintaining a strong record. I did this by carving out personal time to write a couple of research papers. I did this by staying involved in professional associations like the American Society for Information Science and Technology, both as a participant and on a committee assignments, and by taking on advocacy roles for public libraries as chair of the Public um, Palo Alto Library Commission for many years, and by uh, serving actually uh, as on the International Advisory Board for SLIS for nine years um, prior to coming here. My point is, and this is what I think is important to take away, is that sometimes you need to go above and beyond your current job to ensure that you're building up the skills and experiences that you may need to meet your future career objectives. And these opportunities may need to be pursued outside of your job or you need to think creatively how to get it within your job. So hopefully that gives you some ideas um, in terms of thinking long term. So what are some of the strategies that you can use to move your career forward and keep your career fresh? Whether you're looking for a new job or not, all of these strategies are important for you to consider to keep yourself marketable in this rapidly changing information environment. I think there are five key steps that are important to keep in mind as you think about your future as an information professional. So the first one has to do, um, and this first strategy is about setting your goal, um, goals for career growth and development. We just talked about mine and how I had um, obviously had some sort of a long-term, um, well, you know, somewhat hazy plan, but certainly I had it in my sights that I eventually wanted to come back to academia. What this means is, is that you need to continually take a look around at where the field is going and what the current trends are what the opportunities are that you're going to make time for to invest in your lifelong learning, evaluate how you want your career to develop, and making sure you're doing the right kinds of activities to get yourself there. And you may need to take on additional leadership roles in your professional association or volunteer to take on different assignment in your workplace so to help demonstrate the experience and growth that you're looking for that will help you in your next role. You may need to fill in skill and knowledge gaps too, which you can do in a variety of ways, including through conference attendance, continuing professional development courses, getting a mentor, reading broadly for trends, exploring new technologies. But as a student, you have many opportunities to achieve your goals for career growth and development as I discuss on this next slide. 
one of the things I think we do, uh, we provide a lot of opportunity for is in the area of, of career guidance and support. Um, there's lots of opportunities um, for you to explore your possible career goals, build up your experience in real world settings, develop your leadership skills, and cultivate your professional network. You should be taking advantage of all of these opportunities when you're a student in our program. As you'll see, I put getting experience through internships at the top of the list. I feel that everyone who is able to should do an internship. When else do you have the opportunity to try out a new job role with absolutely zero strings attached while at the same time building up your resume and building up your professional network? And with our virtual internship opportunities growing, no matter where you're located, there should be an opportunity that would work for you. So I highly encourage people to do internships. I also highly encourage all of you to get involved in student associations and other leadership opportunities. Um, there's also opportunities to submit research papers in our student research journal. And I highly encourage all of you to participate in our second fully online global free conference called the Library 2.012. We also provide students with many career resources that you should be looking at from the very moment that you start in our program. I'd say it's never too early to start thinking about your career and preparing for it. I highly recommend that you spend time on the career development site. We have a ton of information there. And also look through um, the career pathways to get a better sense of what the various opportunities are. And also, if you haven't already, you should install Blackboard IM. This is a great tool for interacting informally with your peers and your instructors, and also will help you on your future of building um, your future professional network. The second strategy, especially if you're interested in new roles, either inside library settings or outside of library settings, that you'll need to do is to start thinking differently about your skill sets and how you talk about them. My, my experience is that many of us information professionals have a hard time talking about our skill sets in ways um, that people outside of our profession can understand or appreciate. When we talk about things like technical services, reference, bibliographic instruction, and cataloging, it can be hard for other people outside of our profession to translate these skills into ones that they, they can use or understand in other environments. This translation process is important and can open up a variety of opportunities for people with library and information science backgrounds. Tim Doherty recently deconstructed what, it mean, what a reference librarian does and mapped these skills to what you would call them in a business environment. I really like this approach. And I find, think this is a valuable exercise for anyone who's thinking about the skills they have to offer and what these might be mapped to in other information environments. These can then be traced to job titles that you might not have thought of. For example, a reference librarian has the ability to conduct reference interviews, which can map to, ind to industry job skills in the area of interviewing and interpersonal communication, which might turn into a job position called business or information researcher. Another example is the reference librarians have mastery of research processes. These could tie in with industry job requirements for research results um, presentation or analysis and synthesis. And th some possible job titles connected with these skills include business or data analyst or competitive intelligence specialist and others. Here are some more examples of ways that you can start to think about translating and mapping our library and information science skill sets into terminology that people outside of our field may understand or appreciate better. For example, if you're interviewing for a position outside of a library, it might be useful to talk about metadata. That's a term that's often used in industry. Or talk about your strength in understanding how information is organized, rather than using the term cataloging, which can be a very library-centric term. Similarly, you could extend the meaning of library out outreach so that it's not as library-centric. Surely anything that you would be doing for library outreach these days would include some social media. So this would be a more useful and generalizable way to talk about your experience and skills. 
Over time, some of this translation may become easier. I'm already finding that companies like Microsoft have increasingly started to value the skills that people with a library degree in library and information science have to offer um, in, in roles such as user experience researchers and usability engineers. Um, a degree in library and information science is now one of the listed degrees that they look for when advertising for these types of positions. However, this takes time uh, for uh, these other external, uh, you know, outside library environments to uh, learn our lingo. So in the meantime, it's incumbent on us to make the effort to make the mapping and the trans translation of our terminology. The third strategy in the process is to take a look at what are some of the transferable skills that we can cultivate and carry over into any position. The skills listed, um, as listed on this slide, are drawn from Stephen Abram, Helen Partridge, Kim Doherty, and others. Um, I, these transferable skills are the types of soft skills that any employer will be looking for in today's information-intensive, collaborative, fast-moving, changing work environment. So demonstrating these quality, qualities or cultivating them if you don't already have them will be especially important in our rapidly changing job environment. I highly recommend that you think about these skills and think about how you can bring attention to your strengths or build up experiences while you're in school so that you can more easily give examples and demonstrate these skills to future employers. The fourth strategy is to tell your story. In other words, be able to talk about your career narrative to draw the connections between your experiences and skills to make it clear what your career path has been, where you intend to go with your career, and how whatever opportunity you're interested in matches well with your career goals. If you're trying to bridge from a library position to one outside of the library setting, this career narrative should be especially well thought out. You should be prepared to explain how your degree in library information science will be an asset to them and what you, what you, know, that will, um, and what you know that will uniquely set you apart from other candidates. As part of this, Meredith Farkas talks about developing your personal brand. By developing an online presence, actively participating in the online world, packaging your skills and experience, and being active as an information professional and professional associations. Creating a LinkedIn profile is a great way to get started if you haven't already to build your professional online presence. LinkedIn has become an indispensable tool in job searching, both by job seekers and job recruiters. You'll want to be present there so you won't miss opportunities. And the fifth strategy is to network, network, network. The recent Library Journal placement and salary survey talked about the importance of networking. There's a lot that can be said about networking, but I want to keep my comments focused to thinking more broadly around career options. All of the jobs that I've gotten have been through networking, by going to events, making online connections, meeting people through others in my network, and the like. The importance of this can't be overstated. It's what helped me make the move between very different positions in extremely different environments. Additionally, I recommend participating online through the numerous LinkedIn group discussions around LIS career alternatives and jobs. I'd like to leave, to, um, to leave you today with a few thoughts. What I hope you've walked away with um, are some ways that you can be thinking more broadly about your library and information science skill sets. As our library and information science world continues to change and evolve, and as technology adoption speeds up and continues to change user expectations for information access and delivery, so do our ways of thinking as an information professional. We need to take charge of our own careers to evolve them in ways that make the best use of our skills and capabilities, both inside libraries and beyond. We need to recognize the diverse ways that our skills can be applied and be open to new possibilities and opportunities. We need to, um, be, we need to be lifelong learners, continuing to explore, question, evolve, and learn. Your learning doesn't stop the day that you graduate from our school. It is your responsibility to continue to grow and learn and build new skills. 
Most importantly, it is critical for you to take charge of your career. No one else will do it for you. It's up to you to own it and move it forward. So I would like to end this presentation with this quote by Stephen Abram, who sums up the value of the library and information science degree beautifully and succinctly, because I believe that we are truly only limited by our own creativity and vision. The number of ways that we can apply our library and information science skills and the ways that we can think about what we have to offer is truly expansive if we open our minds to it. I believe a background in library and information science opens up many possibilities and I think it's exciting to think about what new career pathways will be available to people with a library and information science background in the future. I see a bright future filled with new opportunities for people with our back professional background and I can't wait to see what a difference all of you who are especially those of you who have been associated with our program will make um, in the profession as you move forward. So with that, I'd like to thank you and I'd love to open it up to questions, which you can either chat, um, type in in the chat or you can, um, or you can talk. Sandy, I want to thank you, this is Jane Fisher, for a wonderful presentation and suggest that students or anybody with questions um, either raise your hand with a little hand icon under your name under participant box or just start typing in the chat question section. We'll wait. So hi, this is Jill and while we wait for some students to type in some questions or to raise their hand to ask a question, I would just like to say that was fabulous. That was so motivating and inspiring and I had many, many takeaways. Um, one that I would like to just mention to the whole group so ever since everyone's listening is I really like the point that you made quite clearly is that you didn't have it all figured out when you just started. So when you finished school and you graduated, you didn't have this huge plan of exactly where you were going to end up as you so clearly stated. You kind of started in one spot and then you developed your skills and you moved on. And I just wanted to reiterate that because I've been talking to a number of students most recently about that exact thing is that they're starting the program and they're worried about where are they going to end up, what are the jobs that are out there, how are they going to figure it all out, that they need to figure it out now. And so you made the point very clearly that you don't need to figure it all out now. It's like just stay the course, keep going and it's all going to work out as long as you keep your mind open and you're flexible and you're continuing to develop some new skills. So thank you. I really appreciated that. Thank you, Jill. I appreciate that. And, you know, just to build on what, what Jill said, I, when I think back to when I was in library school specifically, I didn't know I even wanted to get my PhD straight away. I didn't talk about that particular transition, but uh, when I was in library school, I thought I was going to go work in an academic library and I thought I was ultimately going to be an academic library director. And then I thought, well, one of the ways to, most academic library directors have to get a PhD. So then I'm like, well, maybe I'll go get my PhD. <laughs> and I'm working on my PhD and I got attracted to academia. So I sort of did have plans, but it wasn't like I, you know, my plans evolved and I, as I was going through it. And um, I think, I think that, I mean, what I hope, building on what Jill said, I hope one of the other takeaways is that it, your first career doesn't have to be your, your first job doesn't have to be your last job and that you can continue to grow and evolve your, um, the, what you do and you can make changes and you can move around to different environments and it's up to you to tell your career narrative in a way that doesn't get you pigeonholed or siloed in a particular job. Um, that's something that I know I was very concerned about um, and I think that something that you can talk about and represent yourself in um, broader ways that, and make sure that other people understand that too. I had one time I interviewed for a position at Stanford um, in the Stanford libraries and, and the person who was the director of the libraries there at the time said to me when he's looking at his res my resume and he said, I don't see how, what the common thread is between your research and your jobs. And I'm like, really? For me it's so clear. It all has to do with um, my, my, my fascination and passion for the user. It just so happens that one 
time I was focusing on children, and one time it was scientists and engineers, and another time it was art historians. But for me, at the core of it is always about the user. So I was able to answer that question, but you need to be thinking in your head, what ti what's the glue that holds your career together? And it can be a little bit loose like mine was, but as long as you can talk about it, I think that will take you far. Sandy, there's a question from Tasha B. She asks, can you briefly describe what you mean by write, publish, and present? That is something I've been really interested in lately. I'm trying to remember when I talked about that, but um, I, I, I wouldn't, there are, I don't know if you're a student in our program, um, but I would encourage you to think about the kinds of contributions that you can make back to the profession. So think about what skills you have and what um, kind of what extra knowledge you have. And uh, for example, if you are a student, you have opportunities to take some particular paper that you wrote a research paper that you wrote and submit it for publication in our student research journal. Um, there are opportunities to present, uh, for example, in our library 2.012 conference, if there's a, a, a something unique or interesting that you think you've done or uh, experience that you've had that you think would be of interest to the broader population, that would be another good opportunity to do that. Um, I, think there's, I think what's important is to be engaged and to um, get involved. You can also get involved in any of the student associations too. There's newsletters and all sorts of opportunities to, to share and to uh, create content and to share knowledge. So um, if you have anything more specific that you'd like to know, I'd be happy to address that, but hopefully that gave, gave you some ideas. Hi Sandy, this is Jill, and there is another question here. This is from, let's see, I think it's from Laura. Where did it go? Here it is. Laura asks, I'm interested in developing my own research consultancy business in addition to my academic job. Do you have any resources or suggestions for where or how I should begin planning? Hmm, I'm going to have to think about that one. I don't have any specific um, resources in mind, so I think uh, I think what I would recommend to you is to uh, if you, to do some research to see if there's other people who have some sort of a research consultancy or business that you either know or that you uh, are aware of and you admire and uh, you'd like to talk with them. Many times you can do just at least an informal interview and many people, I find that most people like to talk about what they do and about themselves and so it's oftentimes, uh, you can oftentimes uh, find that especially if you're student um, that you, uh, you, people are usually willing to talk to you, um, but even still lots of people are willing to talk to you anyhow. So you might try that, so either people that you know that already have some sort of consultancy or other people that you don't know but you reach out to them saying that you'd love to talk to them a little bit more about what they do and that's probably how I would initially approach it. Um, Laura, Africa Hands has a really good suggestion also, which is she said to join AIIP. That's the Association of Independent Information Professionals. They're full of independent research consultants and they're very sharing and I think it would be a good group. So you might want to look that up. Also Patty says look for Mary Baines, Lori Buttonham's got ideas on checking out Mary Ellen Bates' blog on research consultancy. I'm going to read one more question for Sandy. Sandy is looking for work. She's just, uh, Denise, Sandy, Denise Nunez is looking for work. She says, I have already graduated. I'm looking for work. Does SLIS Career Development have any plans to offer sessions or resources to recent grads to help them rebrand themselves for alternative jobs? I think that's a question Jill can address. Jill, can you address Denise's um, question, please? Sure. So hi Denise, and thank you for asking the question. Um, there's a couple different things, and I'm kind of going back here to the question to make sure I understand it correctly. Um, 
one message that I want to put out strongly to everybody who's, who's still on right now is that it's really important for you to use the career resources now while you are a current student because everything is available to you right now. It's, it's, there's no cost to it. It's part of your student fees. And that that's also includes using me individually one-on-one -on -one for appointments, which I do via distance learning. Um, so you want to take advantage of that. There are resources available for you once you're an alumni that would just involve joining the Career Center, the SJSU Career Center. There is a fee for that. It's a very nominal fee. And then you can also work with me one-on-one. -on -one. And again, there is a fee for that, but again, it's a nominal fee compared to what you would get out in the world of private career um, counselors. So, so you do have resources available to you. Everything that's on the career development site on SLIS Web, that's free for you all the time. You can always access that. So I, I just kind of want to give you your options and know that you do have possibilities. Some of them are going to be free of charge as an alumni. Some of them could have a little cost associated with them. And I'm happy to follow up with you individually and talk a little bit more about what might be the best approach for you. So hopefully that answers your question. There you go. Good. And I'll give up the mic in case we've got somebody else that wants to ask a question. I do have a question for you, Sandy, and it's more um, just to kind of get your thoughts on this, I'm curious about what advice that you would provide to some of our older SLIS students. And by older, I mean that I've been working with some who are retired and they've come back to school as their second career. And most of them, honestly, are quite concerned about once they graduate and they're going to go out into the job market and they're competing with other people and oftentimes younger people for jobs in this particular area. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts or advice that you might want to share. You know, that's a good question. I think that, um, you know, I think I think it's going to have to be, I think it's important to focus just on building up the right skill sets, which they're doing by coming back to school and um, packaging it correctly and you know, in doing a job, Jill's a great resource, um, so definitely working with her, too, to help make sure that you're representing your background and experience to its best effect. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of if, if the concern is about uh, the repurposing of the experience, I think a lot of times people do want somebody who's experienced and bring something to the table. So I would hope that that wasn't going to be a problem for them and that um, just getting as much experience, like current experience and taking advantage of as many things as possible within the, during their um, school um, educational experience I think will be valuable to them as they repackage their, um, their skills into these new um, careers. So hopefully that, I, hopefully that should be sufficient to um, enable them to uh, market and get, get, uh, get their foot in the door in, in this kind of revamped career that they're doing. I'm a new student. Um, this is my first semester um, in SLIS, and uh, so far I'm enjoying it a lot. But um, I'm I'm curious about what your recommendation is in terms of um, what types of classes students should be taking. And I, I guess I'm thinking in terms of um, you know going broad versus going deep. Um, you know, there there's so many different things uh, to study. Um, so on the one hand, it, it seems like it would be a good idea to be you know very well rounded and come out of you know come out of the, um, come out of the program with um, some some experience and some knowledge in uh, you know in a, a variety of aspects of librarianship. But on the other hand, too, um, you know, I, I think I'm concerned about being you know sort of watered down and not having um, significant depth in any particular um, uh, sort of branch of librarianship. And I'm wondering what what you might recommend um, along those lines. Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, I would definitely recommend if you haven't already taking a look at the different career pathways that we have on our website um, that gives you uh, some suggestions of the kinds of courses that would be useful to take if you're interested in going in one direction or the or the, another direction. Um, but I, I guess I, I think that um, you know, as as I kind of indicated in, in my own personal experience, I, I think it's possible to continue to learn and grow and develop skills and twist and turn along the way. So I think what you might start out doing when you first graduate may evolve into something different. So I think, 
you should take a stock of where you think you want to go at this at this stage in your career and um, maybe choosing one of those career pathway directions or some combination of those and blend that together and uh, I recommend doing an internship to give you that uh, real world experience and also a better sense of whether what you think you might want to do is actually what you want to do and uh, and go from there and then I think what you have to be prepared for is that is that uh, ongoing lifelong learning and growth and development um, to grow into areas that maybe either didn't exist when you were in school here or that your interests take different turns and than you expected when you were in school. So I think I I guess I guess I'm not too concerned about that. I would just say do your best in thinking about what you think you want to do now and prepare for that and be prepared to continue to learn and grow after the fact. I'd, I'd also like to second what Sandy said, Jesse, and to add that it's wonderful that as a new student you're attending a presentation like this one and that the more comfortable you feel and the more you reach out to talk to people while you're in the program, to your faculty, to fellow students, to colloquia speakers, um, to professional association dinner meetings, anything like that, you can broaden your knowledge without having to take a class on something specific and you can just kind of check things out and use your time as a student to do that. This is Jill. I'm glad that Jesse asked that question because that's a common question that I get from new students and so it was nice to hear your answer to that, Sandy, so I really, really appreciate that and Jesse, thanks for asking that question. We have three minutes left and we've got Dr. Sandy Hirsch right here. So do you have any other questions that you'd like to ask of her? This is a fantastic time. So please type them in or raise your hand and we can give you the mic. So Sandy, there's a question that said, that's asking you, what was the focus of your doctoral degree? So the focus of my doctoral degree was um, related to children, actually. Uh, I studied the way that children, um, the information seeking behavior and search behavior of children um, using uh, online library catalog as focused around science materials. Um, and uh, this is a good example of where um, I, this is a, when I mentioned that I've always been focused and fascinated by user behavior and I haven't been as particular about which group of users I happen to start out focusing on children, but really my interest was on the information seeking and on the search behavior of users in general and that happened to be my focus um, was on children. And I looked um, my on the twist on that that I looked at was looking at the impact or the role of their domain knowledge, how much they already knew about science and how that influenced both how successful they were in searching um, in this uh, for science materials and also what strategies they used. Hi, sorry to monopolize things. Um, if nobody else wanted to ask something, I, I thought I would um, maybe ask um, ask you to put your futurist glasses on and um, I, I'm wondering what you see as um, maybe the most booming or most important um, sectors of librarianship over the course of the next uh, five or ten or fifteen years. Wow, you ask a hard question right at the very end. Um, I think that's hard to be a futurist because you can see that things change so rapidly. However, uh, so you're asking what do I see as the biggest, most booming areas of librarianship? I think it's really around thinking about the future roles of libraries and, and getting ahead of that and, and um, you know, I think this is such an interesting time for libraries and information centers and um, you know it, it can anytime you have time to change it can be kind of threatening but at the same time it's exciting because it opens up all sorts of new opportunities to think differently and to try different things so I think anybody who's um, thinking about how to 
uh, engage the, the library community um, in uh, broader ways through virtually, um, online, how thinking about content um, differently, thinking about the uh, online resources, things in the cloud, and how to make things accessible and, and what the role of libraries will be in those contexts, whether it's academic libraries, public libraries, or others. So I think, um, you know, I think, I think that there's, it's really about the engagement with users and thinking how, how that interacts with technology and how we can craft that future, um, uh, you know, role for, for libraries. So it's not so much a specific role that I see, um, it's really thinking about um, how to shape, shape those roles. And so I think it's, it's to be determined, to be honest with you. I, I'm not totally sure what that looks like yet, but I think, I think this is something that will be good for, uh, for all of us to be thinking about as we move forward. So quickly, I know that we've, the, what's going on in all over the field and really all over everything is talking about how we get people who are in many ways marginalized be it because of language, uh, inability to use the languages that we are using in libraries, what have you, to be involved and to be benefiting from the services, what have you. I know that the program at this point does make it possible to work with courses in the French and Spanish departments. Is there any effort that that will be expanded or encouraged beyond French and Spanish? Because obviously there are a lot of other languages that are very applicable right now. Sandy has um, closed. I don't see her on anymore, Naomi, but the answer to your question is yes. And I believe we have a new project that's just underway to look at adding Chinese. So keep posted and I think you'll see that. And on that note, I'm going to say good night and thank you all for attending. And Jill, thank you and thank you, Jamie.